Welcome, everyone. Good Friday afternoon to you all. I'm really glad you can join us today. My name is Chris Sumrick. I'm Executive Director of Humanities Nebraska. And welcome to our latest Curiosity Connections program, one of the ways we are celebrating 50 years of enriching people's lives through the humanities. Um, I'm going to be introducing our speaker in a, in a moment, but I just wanted to share a couple things. Uh, first of all, uh, in the throw in the chat where you're from, uh, it would be great. We're going to be uh, kind of keeping an eye on the chat box and love it when we see people from all over the state and even outside of the state uh, participating in these programs. So welcome to you wherever you are. Um, and I'll mention also the Q&A box uh, later for, for questions. <clears throat> Excuse me. 50 years ago, uh, this organization was created to help people explore what connects us and makes us human. One of the ways that uh, we are all connected as human beings is that we're curious about the world around us. Um, for our 50th anniversary, uh, we are working to spark your curiosity through uh, special humanities programs and conversations throughout the year, like today. So today is the third in the series that we are calling Curiosity Connections. And we're drawing from mainly from our Humanities Nebraska Speakers Bureau uh, on different topics. And we've had a Speakers Bureau for 40 uh, uh, years now, uh, making excellent speakers and interesting humanities topics available to schools and libraries and senior centers and churches and civic groups and anybody else all over the state who wants to bring an interesting humanities speaker to your community. Um, I want to give a special thanks uh, to our sponsor today. We're grateful to Laura and Bill Trashinsky for sponsoring today's program. And an interesting note, uh, they, you know, there is a hometown connection between them and our speaker, Andy Jewell, North Platte, Nebraska. We'll mention that in a moment, too. Um, now, for today's program with Andy, and I'll, I'll introduce Andy in a moment, but for today's program, it's kind of one of the reasons we're doing this today is there's kind of this growing excitement and anticipation for the installation of Nebraska's new statue in Statuary Hall in the U.S. Capitol, and that is Will Cather. In the spirit of this event, uh, our speaker today will be drawing from his experience co-editing uh, the le selected letters of Willa Cather um, to, to talk with us about how Cather used letters to communicate ideas and maintain her relationships and think of her life and experiences. And if you haven't don't have a copy of this, you need to get it. It's fabulous. Um, as we get a more personal glimpse into the life of Willa Cather, I think we'll all feel even more proud to have her joining Chief Standing Bear in representing Nebraska in the U.S. Capitol shortly. Um, now, for questions and answers, uh, we're gonna, Andy's going to be speaking for a moment after I introduce him, but use the Q&A box. Um, like I said, you can use the chat to make comments, but I'll be keeping track of the Q&A box down at the bottom of the screen for questions that you have. And then towards the end, we'll we'll pull those, start pulling your questions in for Andy to field uh, at, uh, at the end of the program. Um, now, Andy Jewell, let's introduce him. So Andy is a professor of digital projects at UNL, and he's the advisory editor of the Willa Cather Archive. Uh, he is co-director for the Center for Digital Research and the Humanities, and he's a professor in the, in the uh, UNL Libraries Department. He's published essays on Willa Cather and other American writers. Um, he's just done a whole variety of great things, but co-editing the, the selected letters of Willa Cather was really um, a milestone. It's a fabulous and, and treasured uh, book on Willa Cather's letters. Um, and that came into publication to, uh, 10 years ago, which is kind of crazy. Now, since then, he is also co-editor of the digital scholarly edition, The Complete Letters of Willa Cather that started in 2018. So Andy's in our Speakers Bureau giving this uh, versions of this talk and other talks related to Willa Cather. And so you will be able to book him if you are interested for your own community. Um, okay, well, let's turn it over to Andy Jewell. Welcome, Andy, and thanks so much for doing this today. Well, thank you very much, Chris. And it's I've been following the chat and seeing people from all over the state and beyond the state, beyond the country joining. And I'm very honored. It's uh, wonderful to be part of this celebration of 50 years of Humanities Nebraska, one of the best organizations in our state. And I am, uh, uh, as Chris mentioned and referenced, I'm from North Platte, Nebraska and have lived in the state most of my life. And so I'm very honored to be a part of this. I'm going to uh, share my screen so you don't have to just look at me. You can also look at some pictures of Willa Cather as we go through this. Um, one moment and I will get that going.
All right. I hope everything is looking good to you right now. Um, so I would like to start by mentioning something about who Cather is. I'm not going to assume that everybody is familiar with Willa Cather, but I will say that she is an author of, of considerable importance and has been for a number of years. In fact, this year is her 150th birthday, uh, which is something we are celebrating all throughout the year. Um, she is well, widely known in our state because of books like My Antonia, uh, O Pioneers, um, A Lost Lady, other books that really represented this state uh, to the world in a profound and lasting way. Um, her books have been in print ever since they were published in the early 20th century. She has many readers and fans around the world. Um, uh, to this day, the, her, her works have been translated into over 40 languages. She won most every literary prize that there was to win, except for the Nobel Prize in Literature, which when the first American, Sinclair Lewis, won that, he made a comment that, well, thank you, but you probably should have given it to Willa Cather, and she thought that was very nice of him. Uh, but she's very well known, but there is something unusual about her uh, career. Most people of her generation, uh, writers, um, after their death, and she died in 1947, most have their letters published. There's deep interest in her letters. Um, that did not happen with Willa Cather, and I want to uh, talk a little bit about why and about how that has changed in the last 10 years. F first of all, I think it's worth no pointing out that there are th now the current number is about 3,200 letters of Willa Cather known to exist in repositories around the world. When I first started doing this work a number of years ago now, that number was about 1,800. And so it keeps growing and continuing to grow. And Chris mentioned that we are working on a project called The Complete Letters of Willa Cather, though we acknowledge that uh, completeness is probably a bit of a fantasy because we keep learning new things all the time and will never quite ever be complete, probably in my lifetime anyway. Um, but the reason these letters weren't very well known until 10 years ago is because Willa Cather forbade the publication of them in her will. Uh, we don't know why she made that choice exactly. She never left an explanation, but she left hints about what influenced that decision to restrict the publication of her letters. And one, I would conclude that what she wanted to do was to have readers know her, not through letters that she dashed off quickly to friends and family over the years, but to know her through her published works. This was especially important to her as at this time in her life when she made this decision, it was in the last years of her life, that she was focused on her more mature work and was not as interested in her earlier work and things that she felt represented a different time of her life. And I want to read you a quick quote that will kind of uh, give a little insight into this. She was responding in a letter to a, a scholar who was interested in her early short stories, short stories that she had published even as a student. And she didn't like that very much. She didn't. She was uh, not interested in drawing a lot of attention to that work. And she said to him, Suppose I were an apple grower and packing my ears crop, I were very careful to put only the apples I thought reasonably sound into the packing boxes, leaving the defective ones in a pile on the ground. While I'm asleep or at dinner, a neighbor comes onto into the orchard and puts all the worthless apples into boxes that are to go to market. Would you call that a friendly action or that neighbor a friendly man? Writing is subject to outside conditions, to drought, crow peckings, wasps, hailstorms, just as much as apples are. The honest writer, like the honest fruit grower, sorts his work over and tries to keep only what is fairly sound. Cather wanted the work that she thought was fairly sound to be representing her, and those wishes were respected uh, for many, many years. For over 60 years after her death, uh, her, her first two executors uh, continued that decision. But, but times change, and she saw this coming. She did say in her will that she left it to, quote, the sole and uncontrolled discretion of my executors and trustee as to whether or not to enforce this request she had that her letters not be published. And we're very fortunate that in about 2011, a new executor um, was able to make a determination about whether Cather's letters should be published or not. And that was uh, the Willa Cather Trust, 
which is an organization that is a partnership between the National Willa Cather Center in Red Cloud, Nebraska, and the University of Nebraska Foundation. And these two educational organizations witnessed the continued interest in Cather, uh, the ways the inability to quote her letters had made it difficult to do the top level research and scholarship and biography on Cather that scholars wanted to do. And they made a decision to make these materials available. And in the intervening years, in 2018, when we started publishing the Complete Letters digital project, uh, those letters have now fallen into the public domain. So they're, they're available in a way they never have been before. They're free to read online to everybody in the world. And why? Why are Cather's letters important? Why is it um, worthwhile to defy her wishes and, and make them available in this way? And I can tell you that I my sense is that for a major cultural figure like Cather, it's extremely valuable to see and witness and read a fuller representation of her personality, of her opinions, of her relationships that only the letters can really reveal. Um, when people first encountered Cather historically, when I first encountered Cather many years ago, there was a sense of her as rather aloof, um, humorless, uh, very serious, and the many, you know, many photographs of her was posed with a, quite a serious look on her face, but you realize when you have a chance to encounter her personal voice that's in the letters to her family and friends and colleagues, that there's a very different person there, uh, a, a funny, affectionate, sometimes prickly, uh, vivacious personality that I think is worth sharing with the world. Um, and I'm very glad to do that. I might also point out that for many years, it was uh, believed and often repeated that Cather, in fact, didn't have any letters that she destroyed them all, or that they were destroyed by her partner, Edith Lewis, after their, their de her death. But that's not true. There, that emerged from perhaps one isolated incidence of destruction that is recorded in a memoir of a friend, um, and some conjecture that happened over the years when the letters weren't there for people to see and read. But now we have many different examples that demonstrate that both Cather and Edith Lewis, her first executor, sought to keep the letters safe. That Cather's family, um, who was very interested and motivated in having people have access to the letters at some point later, later, in, in, their, later in the world. Uh, in fact, her niece, right after Cather's death, wrote to a family member, we must keep all of Aunt Willie's uh, things safe, safe from fires or anything unexpected. They wanted this to survive. And in fact, the family that does survive wanted these letters to be shared with the world and asked as they made them available to scholars that that happened. And so that is what we did. So in 2013 was the first publication of Cather's Letters, and, and thanks, Chris, for saying such nice things about this book. It is hard for me to believe it's been 10 years ago, but uh, the work continues with the digital project. But this book, um, which I co-edited with Janice Stout, um, was the first uh, publication ever of Cather's Letters, and it's really designed to be a way to encounter these materials by everyday readers. It's presented chronologically in, in an effort to give you a sense of Cather's uh, autobiography and letters, her own voice telling her own story. And in doing this uh, book, we picked 566 letters that we thought um, best represented all these different aspects of her life and personality. Um, you know, this uh, gave us uh, some nice praise too. Uh, I have to admit the response to the, uh, this book, um, the coverage it gave, uh, was surprising to me, and I think to many of us, that there was quite a bit of attention. I don't want to claim that this attention had really anything to do with me. It actually, what was great about it was it was an excuse for many, many different major publications to have one of their reviewers talk about their love and appreciation for Cather and their appreciation that there's a new level of access to who she was and, and what went on in the formation and creation of her works that they valued so much. It really helped um, bring to light all of these different Cather fans out there working for publications all over and let us know that Cather was valued very much. Um, it's also true that not everybody liked uh, this idea. Um, there were uh, you know, articles and reviews about how we were defying Cather's wishes by publishing her letters. And I particularly enjoyed this comment there on the slide that Janice and I were labeled cheeky blighters by a British reader. Um, 
That's fine. I actually, you know, if those questions are, I think, are interesting ones to ask about how we respect these wishes of people. And it is our contention that we have respected Callie's wishes for many years. And now almost everyone written to or mentioned in her letters has, has passed. And so the time has come to make these available. And it seems in my anecdotal experience that most everybody shares that perspective and has very been very supportive of our uh, efforts to publish these. Um, I want to take a moment to, to show you a picture of Janice and to credit her with being one of the really pioneers of collecting and identifying Cather's letters, of co-editing the book with me, and I, uh, um, she's a wonderful person. And in fact, indeed, the work, this work is teamwork that we do. That's, that's especially true with the complete letters of Willa Cather, digital project that has followed the book. We've gotten a wonderful support from uh, the National Endowment for the Humanities, which is, has been crucial for allowing this work to exist. We got two major grants from them. We've had uh, partnerships with over 100 repositories around the world who have provided the digital images of Cather's letters and their collections. And I want to especially call out the National Willow Cather Center in Red Cloud, who is an important uh, partner in all of this activity. Um, and this work, I should explain it a little bit, not only does it provide the letters to read, you can, every letter is there, the images of the original are present for you to look at. The there are, every letter is also annotated. Every person, place, work is mentioned. Um, every person has a biography, so you know who they are. And this has been some of the most important work. There are thousands of people mentioned in Cather's letters, many of whom did not have any kind of uh, public biography whatsoever. And so we've really tried to recover, especially the people. Um, that she knew, let's say, in her communities in Red Cloud, the women whose name, whose based in many cases, their first names were not even identified or known before, and were able to tell the stories of uh, a number of people and the broad and wide world that Cather encountered through her letters. And this work is, is we we now have 2,600 published, a few more hundred coming soon, and we hope to have it all finished soon. Everything else is in the pipeline. And a quick acknowledgement of the many, many people, students, faculty, technologists, uh, the University of Libraries, the University of Nebraska Department of English, um, the Center for Digital Research and the Humanities, all who have made this possible. It's really been um, a wonderful uh, effort on behalf of many people. And though despite uh, her appearance in the photograph, my dog Lucy did not do anything for this. Um, with that, I want to transition a little bit and share uh, a few things from Cather's letters. I want to let you hear some of this voice and hopefully decide for yourself if this, these letters and what they represent are um, as valuable as I think they are and let you hear a little bit of Cather's voice. And I'm gonna take you in a few examples throughout different points of her life. And I can't help but start with the earliest surviving letter that exists that Cather wrote when she was 14 years old. And you'll be able to see in the selection from this letter that she was a very precocious 14 year old. And a, a quick um, bit about Cather's biography. She was born in Virginia, but came to Nebraska with her family at age nine and, was, and went to Webster County and, and eventually the community of Red Cloud where she grew up and graduated from high school before she came to the university in 1890. Um, so this letter is from 1888 uh, and she was 14 and it's to her friend, Mrs. Helen Stoll. Uh, she said, dear Mrs. Stoll, when I received your letter, I was much pleased for I began to doubt your intention to write. School begins Monday and I suppose I shall go, though I don't feel buoyant over the prospect. I have grown so attached to my work and place in the office, working in her father's office, and to my little laboratory and dissecting outfit and stuffed animals, it's hard for me to leave them. I wanted to point out that when Cather says stuffed animals here, she doesn't mean cute cuddly teddy bears, she means uh, taxidermied animals. Then here, I am Miss Cather and govern, and there at school I'm a child and am governed. That makes a great difference with frail humanity. I had quite an adventure yesterday. A man came in and tried to sell Papa a bogus paper on some poor farmer. Papa could have made $50 on it, but he thought perhaps the man was a snide and did not like to help in any way defraud an honest man, and so he told him to return in an hour. Then when we were alone, he told me he was going to hitch up the buggy and go see the farmer, and when the agent returned to hold him at all costs. 
In an hour, the man returned, and I never had such a time. Of course, I had to talk the fellow to death to keep him. His buggy was ready, and if he got away, goodbye. But Papa and the farmer returned and tackled him, and he made for the buggy and escaped. But the sheriff caught him at Amboy. So Cather was very excited as a young person to uh, be involved in these adventures with her father. And I mentioned before, she uh, left Red Cloud in 1890, went to the university, and after five years there, um, actually about six, she took her first job in 1896 in Pittsburgh. And, and this is where her first career, her first 10 years of her professional life happened, was in Pittsburgh. And there she worked first for the Home Monthly magazine before transitioning to other jobs as well. And the next letter I want to share, I think, is a very revealing one. Um, but when she first went to Pittsburgh, uh, and she wrote back to her good friend, Mariel Gear, who was a college friend, um, and wanted to share something about this experience of, of transitioning to the professional life, away from student life to the professional life. She was, she was working for the Home Monthly, and she mentioned in this letter her boss at the magazine, whose name was James Axtell, who, in addition to being her boss, was also, he was, she was also going to live with him as a boarder for a while, and she likes to make comments on his family. So this is from uh, June 1896. My dear Mariel, I've only been a few hours in this city of dreadful dirt, so you must not take my first impression seriously. I feel like being funny. Well, I began to feel good as soon as I got east of Chicago, and when I got to where there were some hills and clear streams and trees the Lord planted, I didn't need a mint julep. This conductor saw my look of glee and asked if I was getting back home. A Mr. Axtell met me at, at, at the station, and he timidly approached me. I did not think this could be the man, and at first repulsed him with scorn. But he was exceedingly cordial and brought me right out home. They live in a beautiful part of the city where the hills are all built up with big ivy-grown houses that are beautiful to see. But when we entered the parlor, my heart sank. It's one of the big hair cloth furniture kind, and its only ornament is a huge crayon portrait of Grandpa. The library is much better. It also contains a picture of Grandpa, but there are also novelists of the milder sort, and I saw Mrs. Axtell reading Harper's Magazine, which is encouraging. But now for the sad news. The Puritan maid, who is their daughter, the Puritan maid is not at home. She is over in Waynesburg visiting Aunt Somebody and being coached in Greek preparatory for going to going to Vassar this fall, or so they say. I secretly believe they sent her away to save her from my contaminating influence. I'm rather glad she's not here. It'll give me a better chance to get on in my new role. But the room I have must be hers, I think, as it contains three Bibles. Of course, she took three with her, so that makes six. Alas, it also contains many a well-worn copy of the trashy religious novels of E.P. Rowe. I can stand the Bibles, but not E.P. Rowe. But now hear the joyful tidings. Grandpa is not here. He is down at Missouri Mission Ridge with Aunt Somebody and will probably remain there the rest of his natural days. They say the climate suits him and may it continue to do so. I feel that the stern eye of grandpa, so accustomed to detecting the follies and foibles of this world, would penetrate my thin disguise and would cry out, oh, I see her, the devotee of French fiction, the consort of musicians and strolling players. Heaven save me from the Argus-eyed grandpa. Love to all and to especially to your mama. In haste, Willa. Well, Cather worked in Pittsburgh first as a journalist uh, for that magazine and then a number of other newspapers, and then as a teacher for a while um, before taking a job in New York to work for McClure's magazine. All during this time, throughout college, throughout her years working as a journalist and teacher, she was also writing. She published a book of poetry in, in 1903. She published a book of short stories in 1905. And she was developing a reputation and also publishing in magazines uh, with, with some different people. And this reputation and the quality of her stories and her ability as a journalist got her a really great job in New York at, with McClure's Magazine. Now, McClure's Magazine um, was one of the uh, highest circulating and most well-known influential magazines of the day, famous not only for the poetry fiction that it published, including you know, the Sherlock Holmes stories and Robert Louis Stevenson and those, those works that, uh, I that were very important in the day, but also for its journalism. 
often referred to as muckraking journalism, investigative journalism that um, uncovered scandal in, in municipalities and companies like the Standard Oil Company, and it got quite a reputation. So when Cather joined this office, she was joining uh, a, an influential and intense workplace. And it was from that context that she wrote this next letter to a, another important American writer, Sarah Orne Jewett. Sarah Orne Jewett and Cather had met while Cather was on assignment in Boston, and they got to be good friends, and Jewett was an important mentor to Cather and an encourager of her. Um, in 19, and this, this letter is from December of 1908, when Cather had been working at McClure's Magazine for a couple of years. And uh, you can tell, and I'll read part of it because it's a very long letter, that she is uncertain about what course her life is going to take, about whether this magazine work is, is going to fulfill her or whether she can take the risk and pursue the writing that she has dreamed of doing for so long. Here's part of this letter. My dear, dear Miss Jewett, such a kind and earnest and friendly letter as you sent me. I've read it over many times. I've been in deep perplexity these last few years and troubles that concern only one's habits of mind are such personal things that they're hard to talk about. You see, I was not made to have to do with affairs, what Mr. McClure calls men and measures. If I get on in that kind of work at all, it's by going at it with the sort of energy most people only have to exert on rare occasions. Consequently, I live about as much during the day as a trapeze performer does when he is on the bars. It's catch the right bar at the right minute or into the net you go. I feel all the time so dispossessed and bereft of myself my mind is off doing trapeze work all day long and only comes back to me when it is dog tired and wants to creep into my body and sleep. Mr. McClure tells me that he does not think I will ever be able to do much at writing, that I'm a good executive, I better let it go at that. I sometimes, indeed I very often, think that he's right. If I've been going forward at all in the last five years, it ha has been progress of the head and not of the hand. At 34, one ought to have some sureness in their pinpoint, some facility in turning out a story. In other matters and things about the office, I can usually do what I set out to do and I can learn by experience. But when it comes to writing, I'm a newborn baby every time. I always come into it naked and shivery and without any bones. I never learn anything about it at all. I sometimes wonder, whether one can possibly be meant to do the thing for which they are more blind and inept and blundering at than anything else in the world. But the question of work aside, one has a right to live and reflect and feel a little. When I was teaching, I did. I learned more or less all the time, but now I have the feeling of standing still, except for a certain kind of facility and getting the sort of material that Mr. McClure wants. Of course, there are interesting people and interesting things in the day's work, but it's all like going around the world in a railway train and never getting off to see anything closer. I don't have a reporter's mind. I can't get things and fleeting glimpses and I can't get any pleasure out of them. And if the excitement of it and, and the excitement of it doesn't stimulate me, it only wears me out. So whether or not the chief is right about my never doing much writing, I think one's immortal soul ought to be considered a little he thrives on this perpetual debauch, but five years more of it will make me a fat, sour, ill-tempered lady and fussy, worst of all, and assertive. All people who do feats on the flying trapeze and never think are as cocky as terriers after rats, you know, devotedly Willa Cather. Well, as we all know, Cather did leave McClure's, and she left his first career as a journalist and became a professional novelist. She first took a break in 1912 and, and published her first novel, Alexander's Bridge. It's set in Boston, in London, and it's all right. Uh, it's not a. It's it's a little derivative of other kind of writers she was trying to model at the time. There are some great parts in it, but it doesn't really uh, signal the Cather that was to come as much as her next book, and that was O oh, Pioneers. She started writing this book after a trip west in 1912. Um, and really having a break away from that environment she described in the last letter uh, and got a certain confidence in herself, a freshness of perspective, a confidence that allowed her to write with real seriousness and courage about the place that she knew very, very well. And that place, of course, was Nebraska. 
And I want to read a letter that she wrote early in this process where she was, this book had been partially written, but the, a large part of it has just been conceived. It's uh, from April of 1912 when she was on that trip west. She first went to Winslow, Arizona to visit her brother there. And she writes her good friend, Elsie Surgeon from Winslow in 1912. She says, dear Elsie, I've been tramping about the West for two weeks now and have just reached my mail, which was all forwarded here to Winslow. The West always paralyzes me a little. When I'm away from it, I only remember the tang on the tongue. When I come back, I always feel a little the fright I felt when I was a child. I always feel afraid of losing something. I don't in the least know what it is. It's real enough to make a tightness in my chest even now. And when I was little, it was even stronger. I can never entirely let myself go with the current. I always fight it just a little, just as people who can't swim fight it when they're dropped into the water. It's, it is partly the feeling that there are so many miles between you and anything, and partly the fear that the everlasting wind may make you contented and put you to sleep. I used to always be sure that I'd never get out, that I would die in a cornfield. Now I know that I'll get out again, but I still get attacks of fright. I wish I didn't. I somehow feel that if one were really a fit person to write about a country, they wouldn't feel that. I think she got over that feeling and, and realized that she was a fit person to write about the country. She did it with O Pioneer. She did it again in a different way with The Song of the Lark in 1915, uh, which is a, a wonderful novel about a young woman from the West. In this case, it's uh, Colorado, though it's really a version of Red Cloud, Nebraska, um, and who becomes an opera singer. And then, of course, in 1918, she published a book that um, is probably her best known book, at least around here, My Antonia. It was heralded as a, a really remarkable, remarkable book that directly related to her experiences in Red Cloud and Webster County, Nebraska. And I want to share a bit of a letter um, that she wrote to her good friends from Red Cloud, uh, her good friend Carrie Minor Sherwood, when she was working on My Antonia and talking about the way her memories were influencing that book. She says, my dear Carrie, I've been up in New Hampshire all fall and I did not know of your dear mother's death until a few days ago when I was looking over a pile of red cloud papers that had accumulated in my absence. Father does not write to me very often and he always hates to write bad news. You said last summer that your mother was so changed by her illness that you felt she got very little satisfaction out of her life. And for that reason, I feel her going may have been, only, may have been a release for her, but I know you must all feel heavy without her. Even after her memory failed and her mind wandered a good deal, I, there was something fine and forceful in her. And last of all, she seemed to me as much mama minor as she ever was. While I was in New Hampshire, I was working on a part of my new novel in which a character very much like your mother appears. And all during September, I was thinking about her about every day, trying to recall certain tricks of voice and gesture. I've had a very a little of Mrs. Minor and almost every mother I have done, but this character in this new story is quite a clear little snapshot of her as I first remember her. I hope you will like it. I want, by the way, to dedicate this next book to you and Irene, and I hope that you won't mind appearing in print along with me. It will give me a great deal of pleasure to have your names in a book of mine that will, in some places, recall to you the places and people that have interested you as well as me. The older one grows, the dearer and the clearer one's early impressions somehow become. Always affectionately yours, Willa Cather. Uh, not, not too long ago, I, I think now I guess it's been a little bit, uh, but we got a, a wonderful collection at the university called the Roscoe and Maida Cather Collection, which was a trove of letters to Cather's brother Roscoe and his family that revealed a, a depth of relationship with the family that previously had really not been visible to Cather scholars um, or any readers of Cather. And it's uh, a wonderful uh, documents about how Cather was so keen to keep her family engaged in her very public writing life. And I want to read this letter from Thanksgiving Day 1918, not long after My Antonia came out. That, um, and you can see it here on the screen about, uh, the, the, I'll give you, this gives you a sense of the challenge of reading Cather's, Cather's handwriting and also the kind of um, way the, the physical paper the, the, gives a sense of of the immediacy of Cather writing. I want to share these words. I don't expect you to be able to read that handwriting without a little help. But she says, my dear Roscoe, your nice letter deserved a speedy answer. And I'm so glad that you and father and mother like this book. 
most of the critics too seem to find this the best book I have done. I got quite a wonderful letter about it from France today, and it'll be published in France very soon. Personally, I like the book before this one better because there is more warmth and struggle in it. And all, but all the critics find Antonia more artistic. A man in the nation writes that, quote, it exists in an atmosphere of its own, an atmosphere of pure beauty. Nonsense. It's the atmosphere of my grandmother's kitchen and nothing else. Booth Tarkington writes that it is simple as a country prayer meeting or a Greek temple and is beautiful. There are lots of these people who can't write anything true themselves who yet recognize it when they see it. And whatever is really true is true for all people. As long as one says, well, people stand this or that, one gets nowhere. Either have to be utterly commonplace or else do the thing people don't want because it has not yet been invented. No really true, new and original thing is wanted. People have to learn to like new things. Lovingly, Willa. After writing My Antonia, Cather wrote a book about a young man named Claude from Nebraska who was left behind unfulfilled plans, a disappointing marriage, and joined uh, the American Expeditionary Force in World War I. And this was a story based on her. Uh, a, a story inspired, a novel inspired by her cousin, G.P. Cather, who indeed was uh, the first officer from Nebraska um, killed in World War I. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a beautiful book. Not, not everybody knows about it, but it has had a resurgence of interest in recent years. And I encourage those who aren't familiar with Cather's war novel to explore it. It's a, a, a distinctive take on the experience that combines the home front following of the war and, and the, the threat of all that was happening during World War I with the experience of the soldiers in the war. And I want to share a, a letter, a part of a letter that she wrote to her friend Dorothy Canfield Fisher, who she had known since she was a teenager in Lincoln and who was another very successful writer. Uh, and, she, and she and Cather um, shared lots about this novel and, and Fisher was an important uh, sounding board for her as she thought through some of the um, choices she was making on the novel. Uh, this is from March of 1922. Kelly said, uh, my dear Dorothy, yes, the book will be classed as a war story, which means it'll sell, sell about 12,000. And God knows I never wanted to write a war story. I lost six months refraining from putting pen to paper on this one, but it stood between me and anything else. It was like this. My cousin, Grosvenor, was born on the farm next to my father's. I helped to take care of him when he was little. We are very much alike and very different. He could never escape from the misery of being himself except in action. And whatever he put his hand to turned out either ugly or ridiculous. There were years when we avoided each other. He had a contempt for my way of escape and his own ways led to absurdities. I was staying on in his father's farm when the, farm, when the war broke out. We spent the first week hauling wheat to town. And on those long rides on the wheat, we talked for the first time in years, and I saw some of the things that were really in the back of his mind. But I went away and forgot. I no more thought of writing a story about him than of writing about my own nose. It was all too painfully familiar. It was just to escape from him and his kind that I wrote at all. He went over in July 1917. He was killed at Cantigny May 27th of the next year. That anything so glorious could have happened to anyone so disinherited of hope. Timidly, angrily, he used to ask me about the geography of France on the wheat wagon. Well, he learned it, you see. I send you his citation. And I want to say when she says the citation and glorious, he died while um, putting himself at risk uh, to, and to, to help his fellow soldiers. He, he got up on a parapet and, and, and helped guide some artillery fire. And by exposing himself in that way to, to gunshot, he was hit and died. And he was given a citation for bravery. I came first upon this citation and his death in the morning paper when I was having my hair shampooed in a hairdresser shop. From then on, he was in my mind. The two personalness, the embarrassment of kinship was gone, but he was in my mind so much I couldn't get through to him to other things. It wasn't affection, but realization so acute that I could not get away from it. I never meant to write a story with a man for the central figure, but with this boy, I was all mixed up by accident of birth. Some was buried with him. Some of me was buried with him in France, and some of him was left alive in me. It's a misfortune for me and my publisher that anything so cruelly personal, so subjective, and this story should be mixed up with journalism and public events with which the world is weary and which I know so little. That's the way things come about in this mixed up world. I have to admit, I've not been very sentimental. 
I felt the rain tied on him. But he's given me three lovely tormented years. He's been in my blood so long, it seems to me I'll never quite be myself again. Yours, Willie Cather. I want to end with a couple of letters here uh, that I think are, are special prizes from the surviving letters of Cather. Two letters that um, many of us really value as uh, distinctive and, and, and special. Uh, the first one is the only surviving letter to Cather's partner of nearly 40 years, Edith Lewis. Um, Edith Lewis was a professional editor. And, and advertising copywriter and is known through uh, a lot of research by my colleague, Melissa Homestead, uh, to have a profound impact on the development of Cather's works, including helping edit uh, Willa Cather's works in their final stages. Um, she helped make Cather's work happen and was a very important uh, person in Cather's life. And uh, so far, only one full letter from Cather to Lewis has survived. There is hope that more might be out there somewhere, but this is the one that we know. It's written when Cather was in Jaffrey, New Hampshire in 1936, um, and to, to Lewis, who was back working in New York. My darling Edith, I'm sitting in your room looking out on the woods you know so well. So far, everything delights me. I'm ashamed of my appetite for food, and as for sleep, I'd forgotten that sleeping can be an active and very strong physical pleasure. It can. It has been for all of three nights. I wake up now and then saturated with the pleasure of breathing clean, clear mountain air, not cold, just chill air, of being up high with all the woods below me sleeping too in the still white moonlight. It's a grand feeling. One hour from now, out of your window, I shall see a sight unparalleled, Jupiter and Venus both shining in the golden rosy sky and both in the west, she not very far above the horizon and he about midway between the zenith and the silvery lady planet. From 5.30 to 6.30, they are of a superb splendor, deepening in color every second, in a still daylight sky, still daylight sky, guiltless of other stars. The moon not up and the sun gone down behind Gap Mountain, those two above and the whole vault of heaven. At last, so about an hour, or did last night. Then the lady, so silvery still, slips down into the clear rose-colored glow to be near the departed sun, and imperial Jupiter hangs there alone. He goes down about 8.30. Surely it reminds one of Dante's internal wheels. I can't but believe that all that majesty, all that beauty, those, un, those faded and unfailing appearances and exits are something more than mathematics and horrible temperatures. If they are not, then we are the only wonderful things because we can wonder. And now I must dress to receive the planets, dear, as I don't wish to take the time after they appear and they will not wait for anybody. Lovingly, W. I want to end with a, a letter that Cather wrote in 1938 to her brother Roscoe while in that same place, Jaffe, New Hampshire, where she loved to visit and near and where she is buried uh, today. Um, this is written out of some grief that she was experiencing in her life. Um, but one thing I love about it is the way that when she's disarmed by that grief for her brother who died, for her dear friend Isabel McClung Homburg, who had died, she expresses herself uh, and her writing life in a way that is distinctive and only in a way that a letter could capture. Um, it doesn't have the polish of a, her published essays, which are also amazing on this topic, but it has a different tone because she's writing directly to her brother, someone she loved. She says, my dear brother, I'm up here alone at this hotel in the woods where I've done most of my best work and where the proprietors are so kind to me. I finish Antonia here, finish a lost lady and began the archbishop. The best part of all the better books was written here. It was Isabel who first brought me here. You cannot imagine what her death means to me. It came just four months after Douglas's death before I'd got my nerve steady again. No other living person cared as much about my work through 38 years as she did. But as for me, I've cared too much about people and places, cared too hard. It made me as a writer, but it will break me in the end. I feel as if I couldn't go another step. People say I have a classic style. A few of them know it's the heat under the simple words that counts. I early learned that if you loved your theme enough, you could be as mild as a May morning and still make other people care. It's that one thing, that simple, really caring for an old Margie, an old cat, an old anything. 
Margie is their, uh, their, a member of their family, who, or a, family, a woman who lived with their family and their children. I never cultivated it. From the age of 20 on, I did all I could to repress it. And that effort of mine did, after years, give me a fairly good style, style being merely the writer. Now, the person himself, what he was born with and what he has done for himself. Isabel watched me every step of the way. But the source of supply seems to be getting low. I work a little every day to save my reason to escape from myself, but those sentences do not come as sharp and clear as they used to. The pictures are a little blurred. Perhaps it's fatigue only. This book has been twice interrupted by death and twice by illness. I keep it up, not for the book itself, but for the peace it brings me to follow old activity that used to be so happy and so rapid and so absolutely absorbing. But goodbye, dear. I've not written so long a letter in a long time, W. To me, these letters reveal a, a, a part of Cather, a, a depth of her experience that otherwise wasn't available to us. And it's been an honor to be able to share them with the world through the book and the website and to be able to share them with you today. And I uh, thank you very much and hope we have a little time for some conversation. Thank you. Andy, thanks so much. Um, we do have time to answer a few questions here, but I just have to say, every time I hear or read a letter of, of Willa Cather's, I just um, I try to imagine the act of so much beauty in one letter to one person. I think we lose track of the fact that you know people are usually writing now to mass audiences, and everything you re you read was one letter to one person, and it just. Yeah never ceases to amaze me. One thing I, th one thing I think about with that, Chris, is um, many of these letters were to people she did not see in person very often. So the depth of her relationship with them was through what she could express to them in the letters. And so it gave them a real meaning um, beyond just sharing information. It, it was how she's going to share herself with, with her friends and with her family. And so she gave her heart to it. Yeah, remarkable. Um, Andy, the first question we have, and I will just say, yeah, please feel free to pop questions in the Q&A box. We have a few minutes, or you can just up up uh, vote other people's questions if you like them. But uh, Nathan Meyer is asking you if there is any one thing found in the letters that surprised Cather scholars the most. Nathan, thanks for being here today. It's good to hear questions from you. I um, it would. It, there isn't one thing. There are thousands of things, and by those things, I mean the the the, the textures, the details, um, the insight that's given to so many aspects of her life. A, a kind of collective thing that I think comes from all of those details that uh, is the profound way in which, though Cather was depicted as a relatively isolated artist for a long time. Um, that was how her biographers portrayed her as someone who was fairly remote and removed. That in fact, the letters you know, that's just not true. She is a very engaged person, that the people and friends and colleagues in her life helped form the art that she made, that she invited them into that. Um, and it really uh, reframed how we understood what a writer's life is. And I think a much more honest representation of how every person, every creative person relies on those around them, the community around them to generate that art and be supported in that. And I think that is a, a, a different way of understanding Cather that it's a, a profound shift from how Cather was understood when I first started learning about her. Thanks, Andy. Um, Mary Vaughn in Hastings is asking you about how, how did you just develop an ability to read Willa's handwriting, I'm sorry, Ms. Cather's handwriting, yeah. um, over time, uh, it, could you just, now can you just decipher it easily? Yes, um, it, it was just something that emerged over time because I kept struggling with it. I had uh, the fortune, I would get fortune, I was working on this book years ago uh, to find something I had done when I was a graduate student and helping out uh, the producers and directors of a Cather documentary at PBS when I, they'd asked me to, to transcribe some of her letters then, and I did a pretty terrible job. Um, and so I was glad to find those again and realize how much more I could see now after time and experience that it became visible to me. And uh, it is just something that has grown. Uh, looking 
looking across all the different letters where there are different hands at different parts of her life. Sometimes she had an injured hand and that would affect things. Um, I think it's given me a, a, a appreciation of being able, or a gift for being able to do that. But one of the secrets is to blur your vision a little bit because she doesn't always make every, every letter distinct and you have to be informed by the context. Uh, the hardest parts that remain in our, in our transcriptions, there are a few question marks that remain, mostly their names or people who we don't know for sure who she's responding to or not sure if she's spelling it right because she wasn't always the greatest speller. That's great. Blur your vision. There's something very deep in that comment, Andy. That's <laughs> awesome. um, and Lori Newcomb wants to know, uh, if, was there an extent that Cather's scholars were conflicted about publishing, you know, publishing her letters? You know, you you talked about that change in, you know, yeah. in, in early like, 2011 or whatever you said. Um, how did that play out in the scholarly community, uh, that argument? Well, if you're thinking about the scholarly community, I they were anxious, anxious to be able to have access to Cather's letters because of the insight it provide for their work on, in a variety of different ways, whether it's people who want more insights into the kind of inspirations and influences behind certain novels or works, or those who are interested in certain parts of Cather's biography. The a huge challenge to the scholarly world was the lack of access. So um, I have not encountered, among those I know from Cather conferences and seminars, um, any, any really alternate visions or, or challenges to that choice. I have encountered in some other people who have felt that um, there is something uncomfortable about making that choice. Though in conversation with them, usually I think they understand the other perspective too. And it has been a fairly small number of people. I think because so much time has passed and because um, those wishes were respected while all of those who were the sort of living participants of the correspondence were around, um, that it changes how people see it. They they're really belong to our shared cultural history now. Excellent. Okay, thank you. Um, I guess I'll finish with, this is kind of, asking you to maybe stretch and look ahead a little bit now. Um, you've spent all this time deeply um, investigating these personal letters, these handwritten letters, type letters, and so forth, and really getting to know this author in a, in a way that few people do probably um, through your work. If you could, I'm, I'm just thinking about you know, this lost act, and people have been writing in the, in the comments about this, the lost art of writing letters and how meaningful letters are to people. And so, you know, if you go 50 years in the future or whatever, 50 to 100 years and look at people, you know, how people like you will be researching the writers of today or the historical figures of, you know, today and won't really have, you know, written letters like that. How, how do you see that job changing? Like, what are they, what are they going to be looking at? I, um, I think strangely the two most likely scenarios that I could imagine are also polar opposites. One is too much information. That is, you have everybody's email, you know, or you have somebody's, if somebody archives their email, which is fairly rare still today, and where there is a, an enormous volume of correspondence or someone uh, gives like the computer they use to write books to it. And then that computer, you're able to track every keystroke and every single formation of that. It's so much data that it could be hard to understand a narrative and a story of that person. Or the other alternative is it's all disappeared, right? They're, like the, the, the digital stuff isn't archived, isn't saved. Um, we don't, we haven't had enough lived experience to know how that will play out. I'm sure there'll be multiple stories in multiple ways. I do know that places like the UNL libraries, we are um, working and in in, in are thinking about archiving born digital or digital materials, things that are digital from the beginning. Um, so that cultural history that is takes that form is saved. And certainly the libraries around the world are also doing that. So hopefully there'll be some access. Uh, it could be overwhelming. It's enough to deal with 3,000 gather letters. You can imagine if there are 300,000 emails, um, how someone works with that. Yeah, thank you, great. Um, and I'm gonna try to tie in kind of the last question we have here, and then I'll just make a few wrap up comments. But, you know, again, all your time and research with, with Willa Cather, I, you know, I'm wondering if you can say, say something about how you feel about her as a, not just as a writer, but as a person, like what you've kind of uncovered personally as you've gotten to know her so well. Yeah. And, and then how do you, the question really is getting back to 
how do you feel do you feel any sense of unease about having been part of that unveiling of of the cather letters um you yeah. know or, or how, how did you kind of have that in your own head not just the scholarly community but andy jewel right. um well i'll answer your second question first which is i don't have any guilt about it whatsoever i i think that um it has been a a worthwhile thing to make available to more people. And so it is, is um, helping the world we're in today. Um, and I think that um, overwhelms any misgivings about what Cather thought 70 years ago uh, about this, um, about what the world needs today. And that was just, so I don't have guilt about it, but who she is as a person, um, a phrase that she used late in life that I often return to that she said, uh, a, she said in a letter where she she commented that the really great people give you the courage to be honest and free. Um, and, and I think that is something that has resonated with me because what that means to me is she lived her life in a way that was full of self-possession and courage to do things that she that she wanted to do, respectful of others, sensitive to others, but to um, not be not make her choices only to appease others like she wanted to 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 go after the art that she wanted to make she wanted to write about the world she knew with, and the women that she knew with a sensitivity that she felt for them she did things her own way and that self-possession that she has and it's present from her childhood to the end of her days and all choices that she made her her stubborn uh, determination to be herself that's a fortifying personality to be around that's an encouraging model and so I that is what I've taken from her I think about the most. That's terrific. I mean, inspiring as a human being as well as a writer. And, and uh, just thank you, Andy, for not only all the work you do around that, but sharing it with everybody else through the Humanities Nebraska Speakers Bureau and in all the other ways you do that at the university and otherwise. Um, <clears throat> so thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. It's, a, it's an honor. And thanks for all the great work you and the Humanities Nebraska team do. It's uh, uh, wonderful to be a part of this today. It's definitely our pleasure. Thanks. Um, so just to wrap up, uh, I want to thank uh, Laura and Bill Trashinsky again uh, from North Platte for, uh, for sponsoring today's program with Andy Jewell. Um, if you're interested in sponsoring future programs, let us know. You can uh, drop me a line. You can find me in, uh, on our Humanities Nebraska website. Um, we'd love to hear from you in general. We have a, we're going to be putting out an evaluation form so you can share your thoughts about today's program. Um, I want to thank the Humanities Nebraska staff team for the, their work putting things together, especially Christy Hyatt Carley, our program manager who helps out behind the scenes. Um, Sherilyn Hansen, our communications manager, uh, Heather Thomas, our De director of development, Mary Yeager, our associate director, and Liz Mikowski, our program uh, coordinator, and, and Liz and Mary help oversee the Speakers Bureau that Andy's part of. So I uh, appreciate all of them. Um, again, please uh, please fill out the survey when you get it so we can kind of keep doing these things going forward and learn from, from, from this. And just if you're interested in booking speakers from the Speakers Bureau, go to our website, look up under speakers, you'll see hundred, you know, hundred and some 150 different speakers, 300 different topics that you can uh, reserve through the Humanities Nebraska Speakers Bureau. Um, and then just watch for more Curiosity Connection programs coming throughout the year, like I said, our 50th anniversary. So we're going to be setting up more of these uh, in the coming months ahead. Um, Humanities Nebraska is a nonprofit organization. We're funded by the National Endowment of Humanities, the Nebraska Cultural Endowment, the state of Nebraska, and wonderful donors all across the state, people like you, which we greatly appreciate. Uh, so we're looking forward to another 50 years of this work ahead of us and appreciate you being alongside of us. So thank you, everyone, and have a wonderful rest of your day and, and great weekend. Take care. <laughs>